Yeah, good afternoon and uh, welcome back. My name is Klaus Dillmann and um, it's always a small challenge to come back after a very good lunch, in particular today where we had also these very interesting poster sessions as a distraction. So I'm happy that you all come back and we discuss supervisory effectiveness. There is an echo here, right? That, um, I hope this does a trick. Yes, okay. So um, the topic or the common theme of the next three papers is um, supervisory effectiveness. And you may not find the word if you look into the paper. So let me a little bit explain. Uh, when we think about effectiveness, uh, sometimes you distinguish between two dimensions. On the one hand, you have the risk identification and assessment. And another dimension is then more the remediation and enforcement. And I see these three papers more in this uh, first domain of the risk identification and, and assessment. So the first paper by Cedric is looking at subtech. Then the second paper by Arndt Gerrit is looking at uh, internal model inspections. And the last paper by Joao is more looking at more classic tools like a camel's rating. But they have overall a comforting message for the supervisors that supervision uh, has a positive impact. That's good. Uh, what they don't look at, and there may be also this enforcement dimension would come into play, but I see this as further research is really, are we, let's say, optimal? Are we as good as we could be? And uh, this I leave as an open question and start with the first paper, which is by, by Cedric uh, from KU Löwen and FWO. And the discussant afterwards is uh, Olivier de Jonge from NDB and Tilburg. The rules of the game are as this morning, 20 minutes for the presenters, 10 minutes for the discussant, and 10 minutes for you, the audience, to ask good questions. Thank you. Thanks. So thanks for including this paper into this great program. The title of the paper I will present is The Disciplining Effects of Bank Supervision, Evidence from Subtech, which is joint work with Hans de Geise um, from K. Leuven and Bernardus van der from the BIS in the Central Bank of Brazil. Let me quickly say the usual disclaimer applies, given that we use confidential central bank data. And that being said, let me give some motivation behind this project. So since the global financial crisis, but also after the recent banking turmoil and even the, the opening speech of this conference today, we've heard that there, is, uh, there has been advocated for tighter bank regulation and supervision with a focus on the prevention of financial distortions in the sense that we want to go to a forward looking type of bank supervision. Now, one way that regulators have tried to do so is by adopting supervisory technologies, or subtech, which essentially aim to identify banks where financial distortions are most likely to be found in order to address them before they could materialize and affect the financial system. Now, I'll talk mo much more about the institutional details of these technologies later, but essentially they automatically analyze um, they automatically collect and analyze information from banks' financial statements and so on um, in order to detect early risk exposures, um, leading to more focused uh, and forward-looking bank supervision. Now, despite the use of these technologies by supervisory agencies around the world, there's not much evidence on how the use of subtech in bank supervision could affect banks' behavior. And in this paper, we therefore try to address this research gap based on unique subtech data from the Central Bank of Brazil. So what we do is we take um, a three-step approach where we study how subtech events, which are kind of like early warnings that are produced by this subtech tool, affect banks' balance sheets, banks' corporate lending decisions, and firms' outcomes, which we do using difference in difference models that compare the outcomes of treated banks versus non-treated banks before versus after a subtech event takes place. So these subtech events are basically events in which the subtech tool creates an early warning, indicating that there is some kind of early risk exposure in line with this forward-looking ID, which then triggers um, uh, supervisory scrutiny to arise. And we're going to use the associated supervisory scrutiny, including information on the underlying supervisory concern and the amount of time it took to address these concerns in order to study whether banks react to these types of supervisory interventions. And this is important in the sense that this type of supervisory scrutiny differs from other types 
of regulatory enforcement, such as banning sanctions. Because the events that, that we look at are really like um, informal um, ex ante interventions compared to bank sanctions, which are really about regulatory non-compliance uh, and penalizing regulatory compliance exposed. And this informal nature makes it ambiguous whether or not banks would react to this type of intervention. So it's really about um, whether moral suasion through subtech can affect banks' behavior, yes or no. So what we find, to give you a preview, is that banks do indeed react. And so we have three sets of results. So first, at the bank balance sheet level, we will show that these events reveal irregularities in banks' risk reporting, um, in the sense that treated banks reclassify loans as problem loans and increase loan loss provisions, which is in line with the informational disclosure effect that we saw in an earlier presentation this morning. Then, when it comes to corporate lending, we find that the supervisory scrutiny coming from these events lead to more prudent bank lending, in the sense that treated banks reduce credit supply to less creditworthy borrowers, which could improve the, the quality of their loan portfolio. And then last, we find that there's some spillovers to the real economy, in the sense that the less creditworthy firms that borrow from the treated banks are adversely affected in terms of employment um, and profitability and so on. And now what's interesting and unique is that the channel underlying these subtech events is really related to this moral suasion kind of intervention. And in the paper, we show that indeed this moral suasion or supervisory scrutiny channel, we call it, is at play in the sense that the events that have the largest effects are actually the events that allow banks to learn about the regulator's supervisory views or can kind of update their beliefs on what the supervisor can find out using these new technologies. Which we think makes an important contribution to this large literature on bank uh, supervision, but should also force us to think more about the role of subtech in the optimal design of supervisory frameworks. So let me give you some institutional setting. Um, so as I mentioned, subtech is basically the use of innovative technologies uh, used by supervisory agencies to support the conduct of bank supervision. So in the 1990s, this was primarily used by advanced economies and very limited to financial ratio analyses. But in recent years, it has become really a key priority for many supervisors around the world and has become increasingly data oriented in the sense that it can be used for data collection, where supervisors directly collect information from banks' IT systems and for data processing, in the sense that um, they use advanced model for credit risk um, analysis, um, anti-money laundering, fraud detection, and so on. So just, this is just a geographic representation of the economies that have implemented or are in the process of, of using these technologies. And as you can see, it's really a widespread phenomenon. Now, to say something about the drivers, there's two main drivers. One, the global financial crisis, which really highlighted that we need to think about forward-looking supervision, but also a second factor is recent improvements in technological capabilities. Think of data storage capacity, but also artificial intelligence and machine learning that can be used to, uh, to detect early risk exposures. Then there's different uh, generations, uh, which I'm not going to say too much about in the interest of time. Instead, let me quickly say how the Central Bank of Brazil, which is our laboratory, uses these uh, technologies. So basically, they supervise financial institutions, both banks and non-banks, which are going to be both included in our sample. And they do it from an on-site and an off-site perspective. And so the on-site is on-site bank inspections. And the off-site is this subtech tool that generates these early risk exposures um, about um, bank risks that could affect the financial system. And so we focus on this off-site subtech tool, which basically analyzes banks on and off balance sheet positions from three different perspectives, which is temporal in the sense that banks are compared to themselves X years in the past. Um, so for instance, here an early risk exposure could, or an early warning could arise if a bank's capital has declined a lot over the last two years, Although it need not fall below the regulatory minimum. And this is with this, this is in line with this forward-looking perspective that they need not commit regulatory non-compliance, but a, a significant decrease can be enough for this subtech to, to, to create an alert. Then there's a comparative perspective in the sense that banks are compared to their peers. So for instance, if a bank's uh, profitability has declined much more compared to other comparative banks, then there might be an early warning. And intrinsic is about like financial reporting inconsistencies and much more technical than, than the previous two. But basically, 
based on these analyses, the application generates automatic alerts, early warnings that suggest the need for further investigation where human intervention remains indispensable. And then in general, the Central Bank of Brazil, but also other regulatory authorities, believe that this leads to more focused and forward-looking supervision that allows the supervisor to act more preemptively. And this differs from other regulatory enforcement actions, as I mentioned, such as bank sanctions, in a sense that it's not about penalizing regulatory, regulatory non-compliance exposed, but really about moral suasion about potential risk exposures, example. So this is how it fits into the supervisory framework, but instead let me say something about the data. Um, so we have four data sources, very granular. Uh, the first is the subtech data where we see when an early warning is raised, the underlying supervisory concern and the time it takes for this uh, concern to be resolved. Then bank financial statement data, uh, loan data that allows us to see at the bank firm level credit exposures, non-performing loans, risk ratings, and so on and firm data on employment and uh, sales to look at uh, spillover effects, which gives us about 1,000 financial institutions from which about 200 are treated and about 1 million firms that say over the period 2008, 2021. So first, the effect on banks' balance sheets. So here we use a standard difference in difference model to study how subtech events affect um, banks' balance sheet outcomes where the coefficient of beta is going to capture the difference in outcome variables of treated versus non-treated banks after versus before this uh, supervisory scrutiny takes place. And so this is, of course, endogenous in the sense that um, banks are treated for some reason. Um, I'm going to come back to that later, but let me start with, with the baseline results. So what we find is that after these events, uh, banks reclassify loans as problem loans and they increase loan loss provisions, especially loan loss provisions for ex ante riskier loans. And so in terms of economic magnitudes, uh, the treated banks increase these provisions by 20%, which is really substantial and in line with kind of an informational disclosure effect where the supervisory scrutiny uh, induces banks to reveal credit risk that they didn't report before. Then a financial stability concern is that this increase in credit risk also comes with a cost in the sense that it could um, adversely affect bank's capital ratio or return on assets or bank lending. Uh, but when we look at any of these measures, we basically don't find any statistically significant evidence that this is the case. And so then a potential concern, as I mentioned, it does, is that these results are due to the non-random uh, assignment of these events, which we try to alleviate in, in, in four ways. So first, I think I can't click, so I'm just going to say, uh, we look at the parallel trends assumption, and we, we can really see that for any of the results that I showed you before, that the events really kick in at the time that these events take place, suggesting that it's um, really the uh, subtech events, let's say, that are driving these results, uh, rather than some other kind of energy Then we do a propensity score matching approach to compare the treated banks to very, very, very similar non-treated banks, and we find that everything holds. We do falsification tests and also conduct uh, an alternative estimator to address this two-way fixed effects concern for the e econometricians in the room. Um, but then, enough said about robustness. So then we look into the, the channel. And so there um, comes the unique thing of these supervisory technologies is that it works through a moral suasion channel. So previous papers have thought about capital or market discipline as being a driver of the effects of paying supervision. But we'll, what we will argue and uh, show in a second is that the results here are driven by the idea that being subject to these technologies changes banks' perception of what the regula regulator knows or could reasonably find out, and thereby induces banks to become more prudent when it comes to financial reporting, but also, because, for instance, when it comes to uh, bank lending, as I will show you in a second. And so to, to show that it's really about this moral suasion, we do two things. So first, we showed the effects are stronger for the events that are related to regulatory non-compliance uh, rather than events that are related to financial in reporting inconsistencies, which means that it's really about the events that allow banks to learn about the regulators' supervised reviews. So this is presented in this table where you see that um, the um, non-performing loans and loan provisions only increase after being uh, subject to subtech events that are related to regulatory non-compliance, which should allow banks to update their beliefs on the regulator's supervised reviews. Then in a second um, test, we show that there are within municipality spillovers on non-treated banks, where the idea is that we build on this tax enforcement literature that, um, that has thought about deterrence effects. 
And so what we show is that not only the targeted banks change their risk reporting after being treated, but also non-targeted banks that are located very closely to the targeted banks will become more prudent. So that's, that's shown in this, in this table where you see that for the sample of non-treated banks, when we define treated at the municipality level, if there's one bank in the municipality that is targeted by the subtech technology, then also the very close by related banks become more prudent when it comes to their risk reporting and they reveal previously um, unshown credit risk. So that's in a nutshell, let me move on, due to the interest of time, to the bank uh, lending behavior analysis. So here the idea is that um, the literature has proposed two channels to which bank supervision can affect bank lending, either a capital shock channel or a relocation channel. And we're gonna test both um, in the paper. So the capital shock channel, the idea is that supervisory scrutiny could affect banks' capital ratio and cause them to cut credit overall. The relocation channel is about the idea that supervisory scrutiny can, by forcing banks to truthfully report their credit risk, uh, induce them to reallocate credit from less creditworthy to more creditworthy borrowers. So we test first the capital shock channel by looking at how uh, banks change credit to firms after being subject to one of these events, uh, controlling for credit demand and other types of endogenous bank firm matching, and a bunch of controls. And we show that on average, there's no effect. So on average, credit supply of these treated banks does not change after they're subject to one of these events, independent from the, the fixed effects that we introduce. But then we move on to this relocation channel and um, we interact this both subject variable with a credit risk indicator, which is equal to one for the less creditworthy borrowers, which are either subprime borrowers or borrowers that have outstanding payments in arrears. And what we show there is that there is a relocation in the sense that after being subject to one of these events, the treated banks cut credit to the less creditworthy borrowers, which is economically around a 5% decrease in bank lending to these types of borrowers. And then consistent with this relocation, we also show that after being treated, these banks also increase interest rates and reduce the maturity of loans granted to less creditworthy borrowers, which is in line with the idea that this supervisory scrutiny reduces banks' risk-taking appetite in their corporate lending decisions. And again, in terms of robustness, we show that the parallel trends assumption holds and that uh, we can do falsification tests to address other concerns. And then in the final part of the paper, we look at um, the potential spillovers on firms. The idea being that um, if these subtech events uh, change banks' lending behavior, then this might also affect um, the firms that borrow from these banks, which we do by uh, looking at um, how firm performance changes for banks that borrow from uh, for firms that borrow from treated uh, banks and how this depends on their total credit exposure to those treated banks. So what we find is that on average there's no effect, which is not surprising because on average banks don't cut credit, but then for the less credit worthy one, which we further interact here with this previous arrears and subprime dummy, we find that in the first column they, they cannot completely compensate the cutting credit from the treated banks, which also has a small effect on their employment revenue and productivity, indicating that by influencing banks' corporate lending decisions, this supervisory scrutiny can have some effect on uh, the firms borrowing from those banks. Which brings me to the conclusion of this paper. So we've seen that over the recent decades, supervisors increasingly rely on subtech to identify banks where weaknesses are most likely to be found. And we believe that in this paper, we've provided novel insights that the, these technologies and the supervisory scrutiny arising from those technologies can help banks uh, to improve their risk reporting and reduce risk taking in bank lending through this moral suasion channel, which warrants further research into subtech, including its role in the optimal design of supervisory frameworks. Thank you. The discussant of uh, the paper is uh, Olivier de Jonge from NBB and Tilburg. Yes, um, also thank you for inviting me to discuss the paper. Um, so I'm part-time also actually at the ECB, part-time at the NBB. So two disclaimers to make, the usual one, and then the second disclaimer is this is also actually a paper on SSM with a different SSM, so it's the same supervisor model because Hans was in my dissertation committee. I used to be in with Hans in the dissertation committee of Bernardus. Hans is a supervisor of Cedric, and I'm also supervising Cedric at the National Bank of Belgium. So 
is there is spillovers, uh, joint supervision. So, but in, in any case, um, I like the paper, not because there's connections, but also because it's just generally a very good paper. But um, for me, um, what could be better developed in the paper is, or in the presentation more than in the, in the paper, is like, what is the subtech actually uh, that is implemented in Brazil? So I went searching, um, and then I found this in the 2021 annual report. And first of all, they're very creative with the names of their subtech tools in the Central Bank of Brazil. So they have it, it's Adam and Eve, but it's basically abbreviations in Portuguese. But so they have two tools in, in, in place um, in 2021 that do two different kinds of things, but that actually might speed up different parts of the supervisory process. So one is about detecting anomalies in the data, and especially in terms of credit risk, and then they train the model, and they basically, there you can see a statement on how much more efficient it would become, because I can assess 3 million credit borrowers in a single day. For the sake of comparison, it would cost, um, what is it, 10 high-performance inspectors at least seven years to do the same job. But then it also helps in something that was referred to in, in the introductory speech and is actually in, in the letters that have to be drafted towards the banks once an action has to be taken. So then they have a tool also that basically speeds up that process. That's called EVE. So then they say that it's, they can do in two days what should be done otherwise in 45 days if it's all manual work. This is in place in 2021, or at least this is about, then from, I think the report CIDIC is also citing in the paper, um, I found this time dimensional graph basically showing that if you look at it in 2021, a lot of countries are using subtech. But then if you take a step back in 2019, it's much less used. So subtech, so this, and this is a discussion we had beforehand been with Hans and Cedric um, on the paper. So what is the subtech tool that's actually used in this paper? So the, the sample period is 2008 to 2021. The treatment effect is analyzed over the next eight quarters. So basically I'm wondering, so what is specifically the subtech tools that are in use in 2008, 2019. Um, Cedric showed the graph, but then went very quick on the four stages of subtech implementation. But I would like to know, I mean, what is available? Um, are you looking at the multitude of tools that have been used? Is this different generations? So if you think about ChatGPT, are you just going to say we're using ChatGPT or are we using version 3.1, 3.54? Um, and then at the same time, you have subtech, but then also regulatory technology might come in. So basically, also, I mean, regulator, I mean, also banks wants to want to use technological improvements for the regulatory compliance, and this might be different at different points in time for large banks versus small banks, and so on. And there might be com uh, complements and substitutes. So, I would like to see more of a discussion of this in, in the paper. Um, then, specifically, I mean, not I have four comments on the paper that I would like to make. Probably not in the, in the span of ten minutes, but then we can discuss afterwards. And like Alex, it's different kinds of, uh, except for the philosophical questions. So, but it's going to be, I'm going to start with the, the most, I mean, the, the result that Cedric is emphasizing, which is basically like his, uh, the supervisory scrutiny channel. It's, it's a very important result. It's very interesting. I believe the results. Actually, I, I, I think I can make some interesting suggestions to drive home this, this, this result, uh, or this channel. Then it's going to be, like what Cedric was saying for the applied econometricians in the room, some comments on the basic channels and the um, robustness checks you conduct, and then especially on economic magnitude. So three different kinds of uh, discussions or discussion aspects on the different uh, results. So this is the key takeaway for me from the paper. So I mean, they can show what Subtech is doing and they document an important channel. So they show that it's basically because of supervisory scrutiny or this moral suasion channel. So that, and the important, one of the important dimensions they show is that it's not just the treated banks, that change their behavior, but also apparently following the treatment, the non-treated banks in the same municipality show effects and basically um, in all kinds, and all the, the different dimensions that Cedric shows that the treated banks are also affected. So basically, that's important for a supervisor. So you treat someone, but then it has the same spillovers and may have positive consequences for the uh, stability in a, within a municipality. So if you further want to drive home this result, um, I think you can do at least three different tests, three additional tests. So um, first of all, is if this is really the case, then you should see that subtech events in this municipality would decline over time. If banks already adjust, even if they're not treated, then there is less of a need, or the subtech tool is not going to capture potential violations anymore in the future. You, sh so you sh should see basically that the, the likelihood of future um, treatments reduces in this municipality, which is a positive thing. To, 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 uh, it's an easy thing to check, and it's a positive um, repercussion of being, being treated. 
The second falsification exercise that I think you can do is within this analysis, throw in municipality times time fixed effects, and you would see, have to see that the baseline effect decreases in economic magnitude. So the effect on the treated banks on the, is not the same as on the banks within the municipality, but so it's, it's smaller in magnitude. So basically, you should, should see if you control for within municipality time fixed effects, you, that this, uh, this effect should actually, uh, in some sort of attenuation bias, should go to, should go to zero. And then I think more importantly, um, what is important I think here is that it's not necessarily just a moral salvation story, but there could also be learning on the side of the banks. And this depends on how the credit, credit register is uh, constructed. But the idea is basically is that banks provide information through the credit, credit register, in return they can consult the credit register. They can consult this on their existing borrowers, but they can also consult this for borrowers that apply for a loan and they have to check within the credit register what the exposures are of the borrower. So I think what you can do or should do is and check for overlapping borrowers because it's more likely that there will be overlapping borrowers for banks being in the same municipality because lending happens at short distances. So if a treated bank's borrowers have been downgraded, put into arrears, have been in the risk rating changes, the banks within the same municipality that share the borrower might observe this action and are actually taking actions themselves based on the information they get from, uh, from uh, analyzing this, this credit register. So this is not a moral suasion story, it's just learning from, by the banks on uh, the, that a bank has been treated, other bank has been treated and on that their exposures would also be not as good as they thought it, um, they would be. So it's more like a spillover of information instead of like the fear of being on the, the watch list of the, of the supervisor. I think three tests that you can conduct. Then on the robustness tests, so on all the analysis. Here I'm wondering whether in this difference and different setup, whether these are actually the tests you want to conduct. Because what you mentioned and emphasized is that what is the reason, what is the subtech tool in behind the scenes? It's looking at deviations in three dimensions. So this could be temporal variations, so large swings in, in data, comparison to a peer group, and then the intrinsic valuation where you know you benchmark it with respect to a certain ratio or a certain value. But in such a setup, do you want to show that there are parallel trends? Because you, yes, you show that there are parallel trends in the outcome variable, but there should not be parallel trends in at least some variables. Um, because otherwise, why would a bank be, be treated? Also, if you show that there are parallel trends before, but there is treatment afterwards, they seem to be fixing something which is not necessarily broken. So they should fix what that has, has to be fixed. So basically what is leading to the signal. Likewise, if you do this propensity score matching, and if you do it in perfectly on the values, but also the changes, because you want to take into account temporal and comparative deviations, you're basically looking at the twin brother of this bank, which is not receiving the treatment. But then you can start questioning, so why is the subtech tool not picking up that bank to be treated as well? So um, is there something else that is going on? Is there discretion on the side that the subtech tool is actually pick, picking it up, but the supervisors do not have to act on that information? Um, but in that case, if you would be able to fully um, match on observables, and you would see that they receive the treatment, they, they receive the signal from the monitoring authorities, but the supervisors do not necessarily act, you could actually move from the average treatment effect to the average treatment on the treated. So basically, you're supposed to be treated, but you do not get the subtext signal in the end. And then finally, I'm not also not fully convinced by the, the placebo test because there you basically move the events at, at a random time and you don't find any effect. And your motivation is that you want to test whether there might be any contemporaneous events that are basically contemporaneous events that are affecting or lead to the results you find. Of course, if you move it in time, you're not also going to have this contemporaneous event. So this is not, I think, the, the, the setups or the tests you want to conduct here. So this was for the, and then finally, um, looking at magnitudes, so on one set of the results. So these are the real effects. Um, I picked one of the results in the paper, panel A, um, but it's similar to the, in, in the other real effects table. So if you don't look at the interactions with the, the, the quality of the borrowers, it's about the credit multiplier effect that I want to discuss. So you, you show to some, okay. to some extent, so the credit multiplier is basically, you see an effect on credit and you do see or you don't see an effect on the, the real outcome variables, basically. And you show that there is a reduction in credit to the risky firms post-treatment, especially if, I mean, 
firms have been exposed, I mean, are borrowing from banks that have been exposed. And you see that there's a reduction in credit, there's a reduction in employment. So that leads to like some sort of credit multiplier effect. Does that make sense? You need credit to, or you, the, the reduction in credit has real effects. But then if you just look at the, the first line, and it's the same in all the, 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 the tables, there is a large post effect of intervention. Without looking at treated uh, intensity with exposure, there is a large, gigantic effect on credit, which doesn't that translate into larger employment effects, larger turnover? So is there something asymmetric going on? So that basically it's about constraints that are binding, but then positive credit supply shocks are not used to do real investments. Is it something else? I was just wondering what is going on. Then I think, so one thing, there is also an immediate effect of arrears, not in terms of effect on credit, but you see a drop in revenue. I think there should also be stars with Delta employment on, on the third line. If you look at standard errors, so you see that those firms with arrears are downscaling in terms of revenues, downscaling in terms of employments. So is this a zombie story? So that means they have been acknowledged to be in arrears. They start downscaling, um, but they still get bank credit. Um, I'm missing this discussion a bit. And then on the economic magnitudes, what you're computing is quarterly growth rates. So it's quarter over quarter changes. So the post effect seems to be very large. So on an annualized basis, I mean, even, even the treatment effects seems to be very large. So, um, but just purely post intervention without any, any of the interaction terms, this would lead to close to 80% higher growth rate. If I'm not I mean, misinterpreting the numbers. The same for the, um, the triple interaction effect, the, the effect of interest. So is this quarterly or annual growth rates? Is it Q over Q, year over year? And then, um, Last thing in the last 30 seconds that I still may have, um, and everything else we discuss uh, in the break or afterwards in one of the meetings we have in the next couple of weeks. Um, this is not just about, so what this paper, what the subtech is different, differs from all the papers that are looking at supervisory interventions is that most of these papers look at sanctions. This is more like the soft approach, but there is something similar and we had already discussed this with some of during lunch. This is also not just in supervision, but also in regulation where you can look at the sanctions versus the guidance. Um, and this is just to advertise some in-house work of the ECB. So also in, in regulation, you have the requirements and the guidance. So it's basically something that you have to adhere to and something that you have potentially can follow. Um, so there it also takes place. Um, and there's at least two papers by people from the ECB and one has a co-author that is uh, also your colleague, Alessandro, that is showing that there is a differential effect of uh, sanctions, versus guidelines also on credit outcomes, if it comes to regulation, not just supervision. So I think this, this literature can also be cited. But I have to admit, so basically the two papers find opposite effects. So it's incon inconclusive. Um, I'm going to leave it here. There's more we can discuss, but great paper. Thank you, Olivier. And um, in the interest of time, let's collect also questions now and then give Cedric the opportunity to respond to uh, the discussant and questions together, please. You said in your presentations that banks are treated for a reason. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the control group. Uh, I mean, ideally, you, you would like to compare the treated banks with banks that have kind of the same issues with respect to, say, non-performing loans, but are not treated. I mean, uh, so that, that would be the, because otherwise the comparison is the treated banks with the entire set of other banks in Brazil, which may be very healthy and therefore the coefficients that you're estimating may be uh, overestimating the kind of effect. So, uh, I mean, I have uh, no idea how you can fix that. And you mentioned four avenues and uh, the discussion mentioned another one, but maybe one possibility would be to think about banks that are treated in the future and don't belong to the same municipality. So, you know, banks that have some issue that has not yet been discovered and that uh, maybe in the future will uh, have the same treatment. And perhaps this is a, a more homogeneous group in order to make the comparison. Any other question from the room first? It's not the case. Yeah, please, it's yours. Thanks. Um, I think it is indeed important to explain well how this system works and what it entails. Because, for example, if, the, if it uses local economic environment information to decide if certain banks are in trouble or not, 
this could explain why you see those spillovers to the rest of the banks of the same area. So it would be explained by the economic environment that is, uh, you know, forcing the banks to make a change by themselves. And, and then it would not be related to them learning about another bank having, you know, gone beyond a certain threshold that was picked up by the supervisors. Thanks. Yeah, Andreas, do we have somebody from the online community who asked the question? Okay, then last question from, from, from my side. Yeah, there is. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, and it's uh, pretty possible that you maybe overestimate the benefits uh, from subtech because there is another effect in the background which is beta, better data quality and also maybe more data or better scope because I imagine if authority um, rolls out these tools, they will also enforce much more data quality. And uh, that is, of course, to the benefit of the tool. But if you would have a simpler tool, maybe you would also get an improvement already. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the, for the great discussion and for all the comments from the audience. Um, let me quickly s start with the audience since I see Olivier on a regular um, and not the rest of you know that's much. So going to the control group, so that's true. So I think with the propensity score matching, we have the closest to the very, very similar banks. Uh, we don't have a natural experiment, but we, we do actually in robustness also use this not yet treated banks as a control for the all way, for the at that point in time treated banks. And then the result is also exactly the same actually. So that that's one other way to try to address this concern. Um, then about the local economic environment, uh, I think it's a good point. So I think one, one thing we show is that indeed the non-targeted banks operating in the same municipality, they also increase their risk reporting or improve their risk reporting. Uh, but we don't find that they, they change lending as much, uh, or actually there's no statistically significant effect on their lending. So they do like the marginal thing to kind of satisfy, let's say, or, or address the, the, the new technology that the supervisor can use they don't go as far as, as changing lending. I think as if they were to change lending as well, then there would be a larger concern for this local economic effects to having this. Um, and then when it comes to data quality, so that's true. Um, so there has been one significant change in financial reporting over our sample period. And then we can, so at some point we have um, split the sample over these two subsamples, and then we find that the effect is actually relatively the same. So in that sense, I don't think that's completely attributable to a change in data quality or that that plays such such a big role, or at least in, in our setting. Um, I don't know how much time I have left to address other comments. Still time? I think the time is, is more or less up. We okay. have a minute. Okay. But you can also give it to the next. Um, it's up to you. So let me quickly say something. Um, so about the supervisory scrutiny channel, so I think that's a good point. So in the baseline, we can't, of course, not include municipality time fixed effects uh, because it will observe like the independent variable of interest because there the treatment is defined at the municipality level. But what we can do is exclude the non-targeted banks in operating in the same municipality, municipality from the control group and only take those operating in other municipalities as controls. And then we actually find that the effect for the targeted banks increases, which is what you would expect because the control becomes cleaner and there's no noise from the other banks that are actually also changing their behavior. Then overlapping borrowers is something we can try. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of mechanisms through which this learning can occur, including overlapping board members, overlapping supervisors, employees, and so on. But I think it's a good suggestion that we can try to look where they can learn by observing the lending of other banks that are treated. And then the parallel trends, I think it makes sense that there's parallel trends in the sense that most of the analysis is about credit. And there's actually very few signals about credit. So may, mo most of these subtech events are related to other things such as uh, Basel regulation or capital or liquidity and so on. There's only a very small fraction that's really related, related about credit risk or lending, uh, meaning that, yeah, f definitely for the corporate lending analysis, we shouldn't see any uh, pre-trends. Um, and then, yeah, what, what may be broken, what may not be broken need not be fixed. I, I think that's, I think that's, it's a good point, but there can be other things that we cannot observe that are broken in the sense that also risk management or whatever could create some of these early, early risk warnings. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, I, I do believe, and from internal survey data, we, we do know that the supervisors are very satisfied with the, the risk warnings that are produced. 
Um, but it's true that, yeah, we, we need to dig more into um, what may be causing this. But I think I'll leave it to that. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot, Cedric.